from Columbia in high definition. This is WIS News 10 Awareness. I believe he got what he deserved and he was put to death. He said, why would they want to kill me for something I didn't do? is taking a look at a nearly seven decade old execution case. A 14 year old boy put to death for a double murder in 1944. The youngest inmate put to death in modern U.S. history. Today on Awareness, more on the renewed push some hope will clear George Stinney's name. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Megan Norman. This is a case that stirs up emotions of a time in this nation many would rather forget. A time when African Americans were not given equal rights, oppressed and often wrongly accused. Long before the civil rights movement began, a black teenaged boy in Alkaloo, convicted of murder and the deaths of two white girls, was sent to the electric chair to pay for his crimes. George Stinney was the youngest to ever be put to death in the last 100 years in this nation. There is a renewed fight to reopen the case going on right at the time of this taping. But the families of the victims say George was guilty and there is no need to dig up the past. On March 24, 1944, in Alkaloo, two young girls were murdered. Seven-year-old Mary Emma Thames and 14-year-old Betty June Binnaker. The next day, 14-year-old George Stinney Jr. was taken into custody. I was always told that George Stinney killed her, her and the other little girl, um, and that's, that's never changed. Betty June Binnaker's nieces say the only injustice is that they never got to know their aunt. I believe he got what he deserved, and he was put to death. He was old enough to know better. A medical report claims the girls were bludgeoned to death, their bodies left in a ditch. Officers at the time claim Stinney confessed, but there's no written record of it. The trial lasted about three hours. According to reports, Stinney's defense presented no witnesses, no physical evidence, and did not file an appeal. It took a jury of 12 white men 10 minutes to decide Stinney's fate. Just three months passed from the murders to Stinney's execution by electric chair. They had no choice in how they died, and he did, and I think that justice was served according to the laws in 1944 when this happened. Attorneys for Stinney's side think differently. I believe that George Stinney could not have committed these murders. I think George Stinney saw those children, but I don't think George Stinney was the last person to see those children. Ray Chandler says he does not know who is responsible, but says the justice system failed Stinney. Chandler says there is new evidence, including a statement from Stinney's cellmate. He said, Johnny, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. He said, why would they want to kill me for something I didn't do? Relatives and friends of Betty June Binnaker believe Stinney callously killed the girls and say his character, coupled with his confession, leave no doubt in their minds. One woman says Stinney threatened her one day before the murders. He said, well, if you don't get away from here, and if you come back, I'll kill you. And the next evening is when those little girls went missing. Hundreds of people wrote letters to then-Governor Olin Johnston, most asking for a stay of execution, with others calling for the punishment. I don't think somebody that was found guilty uh, of a murder like he committed should be exonerated for any reason, and with him being gone as long as he's been gone, I think it's, it's foolishness. Right now, a judge in Sumter is listening to testimony on whether George Stinney got a fair trial in 1944. On day one of the hearing, one of George's sisters recounted the day she says 11-year-old Betty June Binnaker and 7-year-old Mary Emma Thames came by with their bikes. Catherine Stinney Robinson, now in her late 70s, was about nine years old at the time. She says she is sure her brother did not commit the crimes for which he was executed. I'd like to see them find him innocent. You understand the judge can't find him innocent. The judge right. may ask for request, requesting a new trial. And so would you, or is that what you're asking for? Whatever it takes to show that he was innocent. And, and well, let's go back, and so you, you are convinced that he's innocent. I'm sure of it. Another sister, Amy, says she was with George at the time of the killings. All information the family did not provide to the police 70 years ago. 
Reports indicate the Stinney family moved from Alkaloo shortly after George was arrested. Attorneys say the family feared retaliation from the community, and it was that fear that prohibited any family member from coming forward at the time of the trial. Still to come on Awareness, we take a look at the George Stinney case from a legal perspective. Did the 14-year-old get a fair trial in 1944, or was justice served? More awareness on the Stinney execution coming up after the break. That's what, that's what we know. This case was handled so poorly. His family was treated so poorly in the circumstances of March to June 1944 that his rights were snuffed out then. And it was only later when the state changed, the political system changed, and the criminal procedure revolution we have today that we are able to come before the court and even bring his rights and his case to the court in some way where he can get justice. Welcome back to Awareness. No evidence, no eyewitnesses, and a confession with no documentation. Still, the 95-pound George, too small for the electric chair, was put to death. Today, Kenneth Gaines, a professor at the University of South Carolina School of Law, joins us now with a legal analysis of the Stinney execution case. Thank you for joining us, Professor Gaines. Yes, thank you. Now, is this case about exoneration? Is it about proving George Stinney's innocence? I don't believe that's the way to really couch the issue. I think the real issue is whether or not he got a fair trial, uh, whether or not there were mistakes made, uh, and whether or not um, if the judge, uh, after hearing all the evidence that uh, has been discovered since the trial, makes the decision as to whether or not uh, George Sinney should have a new trial. And if the judge does <coughs> uh, make that finding, uh, the question then is whether or not the state will have enough evidence to go forward with, go forward again with the trial or, or, or have a new trial. And uh, at least most of the legal experts think that the state would not have enough evidence and probably the case would be either dismissed by the solicitor or by the judge. Now, what would be a reason to reopen the case? Would it be because there's evidence now that did not exist in 1944? Well, that's what the uh, defense, uh, the defense that's represent, defense attorneys that are representing George Stinney are arguing. They're arguing that they've discovered uh, evidence since the trial that would make a difference in the result of the trial, right. and therefore the trial should be reopened, and that's now, the issue. Now, some claim that. In 1944, based on the laws that were in place in 1944, George Stinney got a fair trial. Now, we'll remind viewers there was no cross-examination, no witnesses presented, no actual documentation of a confession. Was that typical in 1944? Well, whether it was typical or not probably is kind of beside the question. I, if, if it was typical, it still could not, it may not meet the standard, the legal standard. Uh, you're still, you know, even in 1944, uh, everyone, uh, at least in theory, was entitled to a fair trial. And the question is, even looking at the standards that were in effect in 1944, did uh, George Stinney get a fair trial? Well, if you look at it from the standpoint of his defense, uh, I think you could argue that he did not get a fair trial from the standpoint of the participation of his court-appointed lawyer, and uh, that measured against the standards of 1944, I think, would still fall short. Um, just the speed at which the trial sure. took place was also something unusual for 1944, even. Um, the fact that um, Mr. Stinney didn't have his parents there, he was questioned without any regard for uh, the safeguard of his constitutional rights in terms of incriminating himself was totally disregarded. There were no uh, written evidence of his confession, so-called confession. Uh, these are all things that I think all standards or legal standards, we still had a constitution in 1944 and all these legal standards I think were still a big question even in 1944. Now how much weight is given to a confession Usually. Well, in this case, it was <laughs> given a lot of it, weight. It was. Um, 
And uh, certainly confessions are very, very tricky. Of course, you have studies today that show where, uh, you know, confessions are, you know, by defendants uh, are not reliable all, all the time. And um, uh, usually if you have a confession, nowadays anyway, uh, you've got to have some, some corroborating evidence. Um, there are cases where, where uh, people have been convicted, certainly, just based on, on their uh, testimony. Then, of course, you have recantation sometimes sure. and other evidence that comes up later on. But uh, confession is not the most reliable evidence to show beyond a reasonable doubt that somebody committed a crime. Well, and that's, and that's not the usually point. the only evidence that's used, correct? Because those people that I've spoken to do, during this story, they're saying, well, he confessed, so that, that's it. That's all you need in order to, uh, to convict him. Well, confessions are sometimes inherently unreliable. In this case, there's no question that his confession was unreliable because even from the newspaper accounts at the time, there were two conflicting uh, confessions reported in the paper that, that Mr. Stinney was um, reported to have made. So uh, there was also um, the uh, witness that served time in jail with him before he was executed said that he said he didn't do it. Right. So you had these conflicting <clears throat> reports about what Mr. Stinney said. So at, at best, his, his, uh, whatever he said to the police or said to anyone was unreliable. And if it's unreliable, obviously it calls into doubt and question as to whether or not it should have been used at the trial. Now you talked about the expediency of the trial itself, but what about the entire process, the 84 days from the time the crimes were committed to the execution? Yes, that's, that's what I'm really talking about, is that that's blinding speed for the legal process, especially in a death penalty case. Right. Well, the final topic I want to talk to you about is mm -hmm. race. Did race inherently play a factor? The family members of the victims that I spoke with said no. We don't believe race played a factor at all. But we do know from history Jim Crow was in effect in 1944. So did yeah. race play a factor in this case? I believe, I believe certainly it had to have an impact on the case. I mean, here you had a 14-year-old black child <clears throat> who had uh, merely spoken to these uh, girls uh, when they were out riding their bicycles. Uh, it is uh, not clear that the police, you know, looked for anyone else after they found out that Mr. Stinney was, had, had had some contact with these girls. Uh, one thing, too, is that, you know, it, it's really bothersome that this, you know, part of his alleged confession talks about rape. And so when you put rape sure. and black together, that always is an inflammatory uh, mix that when you have an all-white jury can have some impact on the, on the outcome. But as we've seen from some of the documents, the medical record, as you said, that's inconclusive if, if rape, it is in your inconclusive. opinion. It is, it, is in, it is inconclusive. I believe the, the, the defense attorneys had a forensic uh, pathologist look at this, and he looked at the, the uh, autopsy reports and the medical uh, examination that was performed after these girls died, and the, the, the rape evidence was certainly highly questionable. Uh, especially since they had been riding a bicycle, bicycle which, right. uh, which uh, could account for some of the evidence that was construed as possible rape. Well, yeah. Professor Gaines, thank you so much for joining us for your legal yes, perspective. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Coming up, the execution files, the death certificate, and hundreds of letters calling for George Stinney's sentence to be commuted. When Awareness Returns, we're digging into the documents from 70 years ago. Timeliness factor here is critical because the state of South Carolina cannot proceed to a new trial based on the fact that 70 years have been allowed to pass by and that we don't have a complete record to go by. I certainly could stand here now and tell you that I am uh, shocked and, and dismayed that an electrocution took place. George Stanley did not deserve that and he should not have been put in that position. But I am now looking through the lenses of a of a lawyer who's been trained under the procedure of 1960s and 1970s and onward. Back in 1944, we should have known better, but we didn't. The fact of the matter is it happened 
and it occurred because of a legal system of justice that was in place and that we, for all we know, based on the record, that it worked properly. As the hearing in Sumter continues, both sides are revisiting the controversial case and taking another look at what little evidence still exists. Since George Stinney's conviction and execution, documents from that case have been collected at the South Carolina Department of Archives and History. The director, Eric Emerson, gave us access to them, which includes piles of pleas for a pardon. Let's get started with all the documents that have been collected here. What do we have in front of us? Okay, we have the indictment file uh, for the Court of General Sessions from summer 1944 for uh, the state versus George Stenney. Uh, we have the execution file, um, uh, the death certificate for, for Stenney, and then uh, the commutation file from letters uh, for commutation that were sent to Olin Johnson, who was governor at the time. And, in 1944. And when did all these documents come here? Well, the, the commutation file, those, those letters would have come to us in the 1960s. Uh, the indictment in the early 1980s, uh, the execution file and the death certificate in the late 80s, early 90s. And is it typical for most court cases to eventually all the documents to end up here? Yes, for, for the time, yes. It's, it's, it's very, very typical they would end up here. And where did they all come from? I know they came from different places. Well, they would have come from, from different agencies that would have been responsible for the various aspects of the case. Uh, you know, DHEC would have provided the standard uh, certificate of death. Um, these are the governor's files, the commutation files from that. Um, of course, the Justice Department would have provided the, the court uh, indictment. Um, and the execution file as well. This is the medical report that would have been included in the indictment, which would have come to us from the clerk of court's office. Okay, and here we can clearly see that the two victims, the Bozard, Dr. Bozard, right. um, did an examination of them, and this is what, what he came out with. Right. right. Now, this would have been used in the trial. They could have presented Absolutely. this as, as yeah. evidence. Absolutely, and they, they undoubtedly did. And let's talk a little bit about this huge file of documents you have over here. Now, what is contained in those letters? These are letters, um, hundreds, asking for uh, George Stenney's sentence to be commuted. Um, now these were letters that would have been sent to Olin Johnston, uh, who was governor of South Carolina at the time, and would have had the, the ability to commute the sentence if he had chosen to do so. Um, and it's letters from a wide variety of people. Um, clergymen from all over the state, uh, a prominent preservationist, Susan Pringle Frost from Charleston, uh, submitted one of the letters, um, veterans, men who were serving overseas, um, all of whom are asking for the death sentence to be commuted. It says, Dear Sir, I, as a Southern soldier, am writing you this card for the sake of justice, equality, and true democracy, something I believe has been forgotten in the case of the electrocution of a young colored boy, 14 years of age, scheduled for Friday morning. We, the people of South Carolina, think his sentence should be death underline he is not too young to die. If he could kill those young, helpless children in cold-blooded murder like he did, his intentions, we want no Negro to try to make love to a white girl. We say give him death. If he can take another's life, other's life, we can take his. We appreciate your action in this matter and we believe we can count on you for justice. Thanks very much. Very sincerely yours, just a 16-year-old girl from South Carolina, name omitted, from Lexington, South Carolina. Now, from the research that I've done, I know that there were, I believe, four people who were executed in 1944. Would you say it was typical or atypical for the governor to receive that many letters on one case? Oh, that's definitely atypical. That's far more letters than you would have seen from a commutation file. And would you say a majority of them lean one way or the other? I think the majority of them are asking that the sentence be commuted, that the death sentence be commuted, and, and if possible, that uh, George Stinney would serve his term. And w the sentiment in most of them, was it because of Stinney's age that they were asking? That's correct. I mean, most of them think that, that the execution of a 14-year-old is outside the bounds of, of what should be uh, accepted in, in uh, a civilized society. Regardless of whether they think he was guilty or not guilty, it, it was more so the age for them. Absolutely, and most of the letters leave that question of guilt or innocence to the side mm -hmm. and bring up the, bring up the uh, aspect of his age as being the reason that the sentence should be commuted. These are some of the petitions that were signed. And the wording on it, although this boy was convicted of a shocking crime, it is not the practice of state courts in these United States to execute minors. So age is the issue that they're all drawing upon when they ask for 
or stay of execution. And then in front of us, we also have a thesis that was written that talks a little bit about the political aspirations uh, that sort of played into this case. Right, right. And historians think that, that Owen Johnson, one of the reasons that he does not commute to any sense was because uh, he was running for Senate and he would run against Cotton Ed Smith, who was a, uh, a virulent racist. And um, Johnson did not want to look um, weak on the issue of race. He did not want to look like he was bowing to the demands of, of, of the black community. And so um, he decided not to commute the sentence. That's what historians have argued. Also, the defense attorney for Stenny, uh, Charles Plowden, had political aspirations as well. And this same author argues that if, if he had defended Stenny with the kind of exuberance that uh, his defense deserved, uh, that he would have basically um, been disqualified amongst the voters for, for further political office. Right. And then doesn't it also talk about how once the case is over, that was it? He had no other interaction with the Stinney family or? Absolutely. I mean, after, after the, the trial, he does not uh, have any contact with Stinney or the family and does not bring up the potential of appeal. Well, there are so many documents here. They've been here for decades, and now since obviously the case is being revisited, uh, now we're getting a chance to look at some of these documents. And they seem to be in great condition for being, I think, so old. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> we hope to keep them in this kind of condition for a long time. Right. Okay, well, thank you so much for being with it's us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. We'll be right back with a final thought. Next month is Black History Month, and throughout February, we want to highlight people who are making a difference in the African-American community every day. If you know of a modern-day history maker, email us at awareness at wistv.com. You can also send us a message through our Awareness Facebook page. It is virtually impossible to determine whether George Stinney was guilty 70 years after his 1944 conviction. The fact remains, things were not equal for African Americans at the time. George was executed at 14 years old, but two little girls also brutally lost their lives. In the end, what the families of Betty June Binnaker, Mary Emma Thames, and George Stinney all want is justice. Lady Justice is blind for a reason. Our legal system should be objectively blind, not taking into account race, religion, or social status. Awareness will continue to follow the George Stinney hearing and bring you an update once a decision is reached. We would like to thank our guests, Kenneth Gaines and Eric Emerson. Until next time, I'm Megan Norman. This is Awareness. <laughs>